So uh, Peter is going to talk to us. He earned his bachelor's degree and master's degree at the University of Georgia and his doctorate at the University of Kentucky. He was the Forage Extension Specialist at Oregon State University from 86 to 92 and is currently the Forage Agronomist at Berenberg, USA. Peter's personal experience has led him to re-examine the human diet and health. What he was learning conflicted with the advice he heard over the last several decades. This new understanding, combined with his forage-based background, has enhanced his passion for the key to true social, economic, and ecological sustainability, ruminant agriculture. Um, he has spoken at many different events in the United States and internationally. Beyond this presentation, you can find him on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at GrassBased. We're really excited to welcome Peter. Hello. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Okay, we'll work on the enthusiasm as we go along. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, how many people were in the session last night? Wow, thank you all for coming back. Uh, as promised, this is substantially different, but there's going to be some things that are going to look very similar, especially at the beginning, so don't panic. Just hang on. It'll be good. Um, so getting started, um, I just want to make sure that you know who's talking to you and the point of view that I'm coming from, and it's always best if we acknowledge what our viewpoints are, because then that helps people understand and evaluate. So my line is, show me a man without a point of view, and I'll show you a corpse. Right? Every, every, there, there's no such thing as a point of view that's nobody's point of view. There's no absolute objectivity. So, um, And, and uh, you know, this for people that don't know much about forage agriculture and hay judging, there is no tasting involved in a hay judging contest. Um, I'm an advocate for therapeutic carbohydrate reduction and ruminant animal agriculture. Um, I worked in forage agriculture most of my adult life in one way or another. I'm currently working for a forage seed company, but I'm not here today in any capacity as a representative of that company. I'm here uh, as myself. Um, so as an agronomist, I'm trained in those sciences to do with soils and plants and that branch of agriculture. So I'm well trained in sciences related to healthy soils and healthy plants. As a ruminant nutritionist, I'm trained in a functional scientific discipline of nutrition as compared to human nutrition. <clears throat> um, Sorry, sometimes it slips out and I can't help myself. So uh, my friend standing next to me, uh, the t-shirt defines agronomist saying, someone who solves a problem you didn't know you had in a way you didn't understand. See also wizard and magician. Um, but as was mentioned, uh, and like many of us, I had my own personal health experience where in 2007, I realized I was a 52-year-old balding, obese, pre-diabetic. Today, I'm just balding. <laughs> so I did that by reading and learning from people and applying a diet that was about 180 degrees different from anything I had been told was healthy. And as I learned more and more about that, and then contrasted that with what's been said about the industries and the people I've been trained to support, I got angry. And okay, that passed. And then I tried to figure out what I could do to help both my tribes, the, the agriculture tribe that desperately needs to hear the health message, as well as the nutrition community that frequently, I think, gets sidetracked by some things that we're not well served by going down that trail. So um, second bit of education about forage agriculture. This is not a marshmallow farm. <laughs> this, this is how you preserve surplus pasture growth for use later in the winter when the pastures aren't growing. And this is a form of ensiling or fermenting forage material protecting it in a plastic wrap, and then we'll feed it out later. Also happens to be Cape Breton, a very beautiful part of the world, and I happen to think forage agriculture is enormously attractive. But I might be biased. What do you know? I, 
So I, <laughs> last night we had a conversation about humanity's relationship with ruminant animals, past, present, future. The short version is there would not be modern Homo sapien without ruminants, right? Their modern societies depend on forage animal agriculture globally. And we won't meet the needs of 2050 without ruminant animal agriculture, but we must improve the productivity and efficiency of the global ruminant animal agriculture. And there's a lot that goes into that, but that's the short version. Okay, ruminants are these wonderful animals that can take something that we can't utilize, in this case grass, and convert it into something that we absolutely can utilize unless we have some dairy sensitivity, in which case we can still eat the meat. All right, so this is a remarkable upcycling of a resource. In this case, taking something that has no value to us food-wise and converting it into highest value food for us. Okay, and there's other ways that we can look at this and we'll talk about it as we go along. Um, I have some principal messages I want to communicate to people. And, and if you are restoring your health, mental and physical, and you're doing that on an omnivorous diet or a diet that is l based largely or even exclusively on animal source foods, I would beg of you not to listen to the voices that s promote the diet that made you sick in the first place. And we must understand that there are people who do not have humanity's best interest at heart involved in this conversation. These people hate their own species. I don't know what that condition looks like from their side of the lenses. For mine, it looks pretty weird. But these are anti-human people. And either they are anti-human explicitly by saying things like, I wish to come back as a virus and wipe out two-thirds of humanity. <laughs> or describing their brothers and sisters as a cancer on Earth. Okay, well, you don't have to chase that down very far to see it takes you to a dark place. And these people have been enormously influential, and they still are, and we need to be aware of them. So value your own health that when you improve your health, you are improving the world. And it may be the most impactful and the most practical thing you can do. And I beg of you to do it. Um, so another brief review before I launch into the topic that brought you here. Sorry, long introductions are sort of my thing. Um, just want to review that eating red meat won't make you fat, clog your arteries, give you diabetes, cause cancer, kill your kidneys, acidify your blood, or melt your bones. <laughs> okay, none of that's true, but we hear it, right? Okay, none of... Sorry? <laughs> and if it did, would that matter? <laughs> All right? Yeah, so... Um, and no, I mean, it, so saturated fat will likely make your LDL cholesterol rise. It will make your HDL cholesterol rise. It will drive down your triglycerides, which in the most meaningful sense of that science says you're lowering your heart disease risk. But unfortunately, again, we're driving at bad metrics, which is remarkable for somebody from my industry, how bad the metrics are in human health. So back to our list. Uh, it won't make you morally weak either. <laughs> Thank you, John Harvey Kellogg. <laughs> if you are not aware of the influence of the Seventh-day Adventist Church globally on human nutrition policy and the food industry, I beg of you to get familiar with it. Uh, it's really quite remarkable. Uh, at one talk, I made the mistake of engaging specifically with one person in the front row at this point. I said, you might be morally weak, but it won't be because you eat red meat. <laughs> 
and I realized immediately that that was probably not a good thing. I repented immediately. When I, afterwards, he came up to me. He said, well, ironically enough, I did graduate from Loma Linda University. <laughs> But he was now a carnivore, so he was well recovered from that. Um, okay. It won't deprive you of food, drive climate change, or destroy the planet. Okay. All of those are myths. All of those are this narrative that's coming at us to try to defend a specific point, and they're all refutable. Um, I've just dissed a bunch of people, and I probably need to stop doing that because I really want to get past the us versus them, but it's so hard um, <laughs> for me anyway. So, you know, uh, hang, don't treat me as an example. Treat me as a warning. Um, but can we find common ground? If you're talking with someone who doesn't agree that we ought to be focused on, a, uh, on uh, pursuing adequate essential nutrition or focusing on maintaining or restoring metabolic health, then, okay, you've just identified somebody it would be very difficult to have a rational conversation with, uh, by my understanding. Now, the question of how you do that, that now, okay, one, we need to define both those, and that's a topic for at least two more talks. Um, and I have some ideas, and I'm happy to go into that. But for now, let's just leave it there at the uppermost level. Um, but then people should be free to apply information to what their personal reality and goals and situation is, right? I, I, I am very tired of government guidelines for eating. I, I don't see how that can be anything but a political exercise, and that's not helpful. Um, and yeah, so I just said something about not dissing on people, but... Um, <laughs> Hell hath no fury like a vested interest masquerading as a moral principle. Please don't think if you're in the grass-fed business that that's going to buy you dispensation from these people. They'll get to you, but you're too insignificant at this point. they got bigger targets. They'll get around to you. Meanwhile, they'll continue the anti-meat crusade that they're on. Um, this happens to be outside of a local food event in North Carolina, artisanal food producers. I mean, they were teaching people how to butcher rabbits and do all this kind of stuff. North Carolina choices. I mean, this is a big effort. And they had to have local police at the exits to keep these people out. Um, so these arguments that we're confronted with, they, they seem at first to be a really stout rope, like they've got a good argument, right? But if we have the time and the patience and the opportunity and we can unravel that rope and start testing each of the strands, we find that those strands fail objectively. And pretty soon we're left with nothing except their personal choice or how they feel. And absolutely you're entitled to that. But it shouldn't drive policy. You shouldn't be influencing what school children eat. You shouldn't be influencing how we feed our elderly or our um, economically disadvantaged through food security. Uh, okay, sorry. Um, so ruminant animal agriculture is the truly sustainable form of agriculture. And when again, when you improve your health, you are improving the world. Unfortunately, we've, we've had an oversimplified conversation about aspects of sustainability rather than looking at the entire matter. And, and when I say entire, I want life cycle on the human beings. You know, I, I want what it costs, what, what happens when we produce the food and what happens after we eat the food because it all has an, an aspect of sustainability to it. So that's what I want to talk some about. The greatest wealth is health, and thanks to ruminant animal agriculture, which is forage agriculture, we can have healthy soils and healthy people. And this is a global thing. The, the, this issue is now, I just came across a paper saying that diabetes is the largest epidemic in humanity's history. So I'm scheduled for something like 75 minutes today. That means 150 people during this time, somewhere in the world, 150 people are going to lose a lower leg due to diabetes. 
So sustainability, this is a commonly used definition. Sustainable development is the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. I used it for a while, then I made a mistake of thinking about it. <laughs> How good are we at making predictions as a species? Not real good. Um, and, and then I came across this, the Great Horse Manure Crisis of 1894. In 50 years, every street in London will be buried under nine feet of manure. It was, it was a horrible, hideous crisis. Cities used to be awful places. And as weird as it seems, the invention of the internal combustion engine made the environment better. And we're not used to looking at things that way. And there was another story that goes with this. They, they could see this coming as a major crisis, so they assembled these. One of the first urban planning conferences was planned for New York City, and these people in the you know, 1890s came to New York City to try to figure out some way that they could avert this crisis. They were supposed to last a week, and they gave up after two days or something and said, oh, it's hopeless, we can't because nobody could imagine the technology that would mean we don't have to have horses as the major means of locomotion, right? So we don't have to have a quarter of our arable land dedicated to growing fuel for the tractors, right? So if you find yourself having a conversation with someone about sustainability and they're not involved looking at societal effects, they're not looking at economic aspects, they're not looking at ecological aspects, then we're not having the kind of fuller conversation that many people are, and that literature is available. We can go there and read what people are writing around sustainability in a true sense. <clears throat> so if we're, I would say, we need to start considering the burden of chronic disease when we're talking about societal factors. Balance that against the food production systems, right? Cost and benefit is, has to apply in everything. Uh, what's the cost of chronic disease? And some figures are available. Mother nature never farms without livestock is one ecological quote that I like. Um, so again, forages and ruminants, true sustainability. If you want to talk about sustainability, total cost of chronic disease due to obesity and overweight was 1.72 trillion, equivalent to 9.3% of U.S. GDP. At a time when all of farm and ranch gate value is 1%. So people talk about big ag, and I'm going, no, big death. Right? We don't have a health care system. We have a disease care system. Um, so what's the environmental footprint of diabetics losing their feet? <clears throat> Diabetes is the most common cause of leg amputations worldwide. More than a million people lose a leg every year. I just talked about that. Direct, direct annual cost of diabetes in the world is eight, $825 billion. Nearly 60% of global costs are borne by low-income, middle-income countries. So as bad as it is in the United States, imagine what it's like in those countries. Talk to me about sustainability when this is bankrupting governments and healthcare systems. Livestock is a key global commodity, and there's lots of factors that we could look at. The asset value is estimated to be almost $1.5 trillion. So when people talk about getting rid of livestock agriculture, exactly what are you proposing as a solution, as, as a replacement? Uh, livestock industries, again, significant source of livelihood for a large number of people. It's an important risk reduction strategy for vulnerable communities globally important providers of nutrients as well as draft, and I'll talk about that coming up, um, in mixed farming systems. And that's not well appreciated by many of the conversations that take place. And they're an essential source of nutrients. Yet reports, anybody here remember the Eat Lancet papers, Food in the Anthropocene, it came out the beginning of this year. Yet reports like the one recently published by Eat Lancet Commission solely focus on the threat of animal source food consumption, on sustainability and human health, 
overestimate and ignore the tremendous variability in environmental impact of livestock production, fail to adequately include the experience of marginalized women and children in low and middle income countries whose diets regularly lack the necessary nutrients. I'm tired, really tired, of wealthy, skinny, blonde Europeans lecturing to the world about their perception of what the solution is when really they just feel guilty. Well, there's other ways to assuage your guilt. I would recommend them. Um, we can't feed today's world without room in an animal agriculture, let alone the world of 2050. And part of this is just because of our nature, right? <laughs> Humans are designed to hunt for fat. Talked about that last night. So here's my friend's riff on Michael Pollan, eat meat, not too little, mostly fat. Claims about the health dangers of red meat are not only improbable in the light of our evolutionary history, they're far from being supported by robust scientific evidence. And people think it is. It's quite remarkable. How, how can we get people past that? Meat has been long been and continues to be a primary source of high quality nutrition. The theory that it can be replaced by legumes and supplements is mere speculation. While diets high in meat have provided success, have been proved successful over the long history of our species, the benefits of vegetarian diets are far from being established, and its dangers have been largely ignored by those who have endorsed it prematurely on the basis of questionable evidence. Oh, by the way, a PDF of this talk as well as a PDF of last night's talk, I've posted them and links are on my social media accounts, so you can pull that down. Um, should have mentioned that earlier. We're heterotrophic organisms. We have to eat other organisms. We can't make organic materials out of inorganic materials. We have to consume the nutrients that we need. We can't go photosynthesize outside, hold our hands up to the sun and get a sweet taste in our mouth. That doesn't work. Um, so something's got to die if we're going to live. And any form of agriculture is going to have an environmental impact. And I'm here to say that the environmental impact that comes from ruminant animal agriculture is fundamentally different than that from crop commodity agriculture. Um, life on Earth is basically cycling CO2 at this point. We have photosynthesis. We're taking carbon dioxide and water. Via photosynthesis, we're fixing that into carbohydrate, producing oxygen, both of which we need one pro, you know, first hand and the other second hand, I would argue. <clears throat> and then heterotrophic organisms consume either the plants or animals that have consumed those plants. And then the CO2 is re-emitted. There's a cycling of CO2. Sorry? That's uh, crimson clover. It's a winter annual clover. Very common down in this part of the world. We, we use a lot of it. Um, we, as if I'm actually doing it. Um, <laughs> the royal we. Um, so the most, the, the most abundant carbohydrate in the biosphere is cellulose. And these are glucose molecules linked together in a specific form, but no vertebrate animal makes the cellulase enzyme that's necessary to break those bonds, to get that energy back out. So we're entirely dependent on microorganisms that do produce cellulase that then make that energy available. Okay, so starch is glucose units hooked together in a different configuration, and obviously we can use starch, the question of whether we should or not. That's, yeah, sorry. Um, another riff on Mr. Pollan, um, you know, <laughs> If the emergence of agriculture was replicated seven different times in widely separated parts of the world by peoples who had no contact using different plants and different animals at about the same time, one, how can it be called the worst mistake if we've done it seven times? And isn't it remarkable that it happened at about the same time? What was happening globally that fostered that kind of 
an approach by human beings in their environment to increase the productivity of the environments in which they were living. And to be sure, there are problems with some of our agricultural systems. In North America, here's just a partial list, low biodiversity, intensive inputs, increased insect, weed, and disease problems, stagnant yields, environmental problems like soil erosion, degradation, sedimentation of reservoirs, water contamination, eutrophication, depleting groundwater reserves, uh, nutrient imbalances, all that's true. There's lots of work to be done. Uh, it's the loading of water with nutrients such that you then have an a overgrowth of um, organisms that then when they die, you end up having oxygen being depleted to degrade. <clears throat> Good question. Thank you. Uh, and I'm here to say that well-managed, and that's key, well-managed ruminant agriculture can build soil carbon, soil microbial function. It can enhance water infiltration and retention in soils. It can build soil fertility. It can minimize erosion. It can enhance watershed hydrologic function. It can enhance wildlife and biodiversity. It can increase soils as net greenhouse gas sink. It can improve livestock production and economic returns while improving improving the resource base. And oh, by the way, we get ribeye. <laughs> or lamb chop, or cheese, or what have you. Sorry? Bacon. Well, bacon, pork is a monogastric. They're not a ruminant. So um, I'll push back a little bit on that, but that's for another day. Uh, bacon cheeseburgers, yes, I'm with you, OK. <laughs> Um, forage is fundamental to U.S. agriculture. If you look at all the land in the United States, you know, less than half of it, 44%, is actually farmland. And of that, the majority is forage acreage. So 25% of the total land area in the United States is forage of some kind. Only nine, uh, and then you have 19% of the rest is, is some kind of farmland. So... One of the myths we hear is if we got rid of livestock agriculture, then we could use that crop ground, right? That, like, this livestock is using that agricultural land. They conflate cropland with agricultural land. They're not the same. Um, either that's intentional or it's by accident, and I'm beginning to think it's intentional. Um, so we can look again, U.S. just saying the same thing. Um, more of the U.S. farmland is permanent pasture and rangeland than is cropland. And I would argue that we could convert a lot of that cropland to pasture. I would also argue a lot of that cropland sees animals at some point. And we should do more of that, this, this integration. Um, but again, we just need to make sure that we're understanding the world we live in. Last night, I used the example of how many children there are in the world and how many there will be in 2100, when there will be exactly the same number of children as there are today. When people talk about this population control we need to address, when what they mean is we need to prevent people from living longer. That's what they really mean. It's not what they're saying, but that's the practical impact of what they're proposing. This idea that there are more people living within that circle than outside of it, and there's a heck of a lot of water in that circle. So local food's a great idea. Ain't going to work everywhere. How are we going to deal with that? I mean, that's part of what we get to look at. This is another idea. So we have this skewed vision of what nature is. And it's skewed by basically only what we've been aware of. Right? So... This, you know, dances with wolves, you know, the massive herds of bison and all of that. Well, there are researchers who suggest that's a pathological condition, that those massive herds didn't exist prior to Columbus. Because they were a resource like any other, and they were thoroughly managed by the capstone species in the environment, i.e. us, human beings, the capstone species was removed and all of that ecosystem heaved and convulsed. And one of the things was this unsustainable explosion in the population of bison. 
And you begin to see how that might, if true, skew. If you think that was natural, then you might have a skewed view of what nature is. You might have this edonic view of, you know, life before the fall, and I mean no disrespect, but maybe reality looked a little different. Um, I call these weapons of mass destruction. It can be said with considerable truth that the use of the plow has actually destroyed the product productiveness of our soils. In fairness, this was a quote from 1943. Things have changed a little bit, but still... Tilling soil necessarily degrades soil quality. The rate of soil degradation and soil erosion is considerably greater than the rate of soil formation uh, with any form of uh, tillage, including non-inversion tillage, thereby re rendering the agro-ecosystems unsustainable. Necessary byproduct of cultivation is soil degradation. I'm digging very hard here. Can somebody just give me an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper? I promise not to destroy it. I probably promise to give it right back to you. Uh, thank you very much. You get a T-bone. <laughs> so here's one example, and you can read this. Basically, if you could carve an apple into a 132nd and take the skin off that apple, that would be the soils we are entirely dependent on. Okay, here's another example that I heard. This is the Earth's surface, right? Is it okay if I fold this in quarters? Okay, so here we go. This is the entire Earth's surface. We then try to quickly fold it into quarters, and it need not be perfect. Uh, but something like this, this is now the dry earth surface, okay? This is the agricultural land to scale, okay? And then if I tear this and assume I got it into one-third, two-thirds, this is the bit we can grow the plant source food on. This is the bit that the only food production activity we have is ruminant animal agriculture. Okay, so that's a scale. And the next time somebody talks about how much land livestock are using, you now have two models to keep in mind. Uh, last night I introduced people to the, con to the phrase male bovine fecal matter. You can abbreviate it to MBFM. Um, 95% of our food relies on healthy soil of the Earth's total land area. Again, just a different way to say the same thing. 37% can produce food, but a quarter is perennial forage and rangeland. Only 12% is cultivated land, but that can include the forage crops, short rotation stuff. 20% of global cultivated land was lost from agriculture in 40 years, from 1960 to 2000. 40%. So the people that say we need to be eating more plants, they're saying tilling more land. That's, you can translate that now. Okay, and during 40 years, Canada lost agricultural land to development, equaling a strip seven and a half kilometers by 5,000 kilometers. So the farms, you know, the, the cities that expand, <laughs> they tend to expand onto the productive soils, <laughs> and they're gone. Um, and when our soils are gone, we too must go unless we find some way to feed on raw rock. I don't hold, you know, I think this is impossible and beyond. See what I did there? Okay. Uh, soil erosion still is a problem. We've made progress in this part of the world, large parts of the world. They haven't. Again, imagine removing six inches of soil from an area the size of Kentucky every year due to wind and water erosion. I got to attend a conference in North Dakota, and we mapped all the soils in the United States in the 60s and 70s. It was a major effort. You can now find all that information online for your own property. Um, and the soil scientist was telling me they can go back to the exact location where they mapped, characterized a soil in the 1960s. They can go back there today, and they can see that the... so. Soils are, we, we talk about horizons in soils. So at the very top, 
we call that the A horizon, and then below it is a B, and below that is a C, and then you get down to parent material. In that soil in North Dakota today, the top of the C horizon is 18 inches closer to the soil surface than it was in the 60s when that soil was first characterized. We've lost that much. Okay, you can see in North Dakota, when you had rocks, you picked rocks out of the field. You didn't build walls with them like you do in New England. You just made piles and you farmed around the piles. And now today you have pillars. You have these piles of rock on pillars because it protected the soil underneath. So the fields underneath have subsided enough so now you can look out and see these pillars of rock. So talk to me about sustainability. Choices today determine our legacy tomorrow. And one of the things that we've got going with forage agriculture is we're utilizing perennial species. And a perennial and an annual fundamentally different, differ in their root structure. And it makes sense. An annual's sole purpose in life is to generate to grow, to flower, to make seed, and then die. Mission accomplished. A perennial wants to get established and then live for multiple years. And so much deeper root system, it's part of how it perenniates, okay? So fundamentally different behavior, you can see the figures for the root mass in the soil. And the remarkable thing about grasses and it occurred to me just this morning as I was walking around, we have evidence of grasses going back almost, well, the grass ancestor is, is put back somewhere around 60 million years ago. Grasses have been protecting soils for a long time, like 60 times the length of time that human beings have been on the earth. Grasses have been doing their thing. All of our ruminant families were present 20 million years ago. So ruminants have been grazing grasses for 20 times the amount of time that we've been on the earth. Yes. Yes. Yep. So this idea here, this is a demonstration showing that there's a sweet spot for any grass species, that rest period between defoliations. It is also going to be influenced by environmental conditions. The idea is if we know that proper rest period, the amount of root growth will be equivalent to that that would have occurred had we never grazed the plant, never defoliated the plant. The roots will grow the same amount. Now the cool thing is, okay, we defoliate that plant, a certain amount of that root mass isn't needed by the plant anymore. That's now organic matter in the soil. Okay, then the plant regenerates. Now this happens to be annual ryegrass. In a perennial grass, we have a lot of energy stored in the stem base. So it's really critical that one, we don't defoliate it too severely. We wanna leave, depends, rule of thumb, four inches of material because then we'll have enough of a solar panel left as well as the batteries that the energy was stored in to regrow rapidly, okay, because we want that rapid regrowth. But if we graze it too frequently, then you can see what happens with the example closest to me. Message could not be sent. I was not sending a message. I think I'll select ignore. Okay, that seemed to work out all right. So we can compare soil organic carbon increase in soil, pasture versus conservation tillage versus conventional tillage. So conventional tillage is we go in mechanically and we completely disrupt the, the existing vegetation for our you know healthy sacred soy and, sorry, <laughs> it slipped out, I couldn't help myself. Um, and so that's the, the, the conventional tillage is the CVT. The CST is the second of those three lines. That's the cons conservation tillage, leaving some amount of residue on the surface, little less tillage. It's a better practice. It's gaining some acceptance. And then pasture is the solid black. But what you can see is pasture obviously increases soil organic carbon, and we're looking at what, the, the, the top two inches of the soil. What's, con what's conservation tillage again? 
conservation tillage is leaving residue on the surface. It's minimizing the amount of actual tillage. And you just see the, the pattern that the more you till, the lower the organic matter. Okay, but pasture is better than any cropping system in this situation. What's interesting is to see how far down that goes. That, that at four inches, that's a significant difference between those observations. And it goes down, and there's a trend lower, but it was insignificant once we got down to six inches. The soil carbon is primarily of microbial origin. It's not the plant leaf litter going into the soil. So people talk about treading organic matter into this. No, no, sorry. It exudates from the roots. It's the plants feeding the microbes, and then the microbes growing more of themselves, and then that all forming part of that soil um, biology. Um, you know, I don't, th yes, Roundup is a big tool in a lot of these minimum tillage systems. Um, you'd have to find some way to suppress the ex existing vegetation. In some cases, depending on the species, you can do it mechanically. If you get the timing right and you got the right, like rye, if you hit it at just the right time and you crush it, you kill it. But if you don't get it at the right time, now you've got a mess on your hands. Um, and I'm not at all... Um, comfortable with that statement about killing the microbiology. So, I, I would not go there. And I understand, though, I mean, there's lots of things said, including here at this conference, and I just... Um, <clears throat> We've been distracted by the whole conversation about global warming. And we've, and we've distracted ourselves. Please stop saying that grazing can reverse climate change. Just stop. Can't happen. Okay? It's not to say it's not worth, I mean, understand what I'm saying. Yes? Okay? Please stop advocating for improved grazing management as a means of reversing climate change. Why? Because it's impossible by grazing management. Uh, I'll go through some figures. Yeah, the impact is not sufficient. And also, you need to understand that the whole conversation about climate change is artificially constricted and confined to only look at man activities so we're not looking at what natural forms and variations produce climate shifts. So I live in Western Oregon. Five hours north of me is Seattle. 18,000 years ago, there was a mile of ice over Seattle. Something changed. You know, 15,000 some years ago, we had dozens of major floods that thundered out of Western Montana releasing more water in a day than the entire river flow of all the rivers of the world today, doing it in three days. There are gaps in mountains a mile wide. There was so much water coming through, it created a hydrologic dam. It couldn't all get through, so it backed up hundreds of feet, back, I mean depth, back up. Something changed. We're not good at, we don't understand these things, okay? And so this, but, but this is where it's been constrained. And then I'll talk about the numbers shortly. So I, I, I've learned we have to deconstruct the argument and look at each piece of it, because otherwise people will willfully or unintentionally misunderstand what you're trying to say. I am not saying that the climate doesn't change. Not at all. And I'm, so don't label me with a pejorative about that. There's a question. Yeah, we'll get, no, it, we'll, we'll get to that real quick here. So th this is far more important. Water is far more important as a resource immediately. 
Okay, this is a demonstration. It's a soil quality test. We would do it in an introductory soils class. This was done in south central Nebraska. It's called a slake test. Basically, we're just demonstrating water stable structure in soil. We've got Sorry, we're going to get geeky here. Most people will call it a clod. We scientists call it a ped. <sighs> so we've gotten clods from a conventional continuous cornfield. The other side of the fence, same soil type, we've gotten a clod from a long-term grass field. Okay, same soil, different management. The technician in the panel furthest away from me has already dropped the clod into that water column. It's fully submerged now, but suspended in that wire basket. That's from the cornfield. And you can see already there's a cascade of small particles coming off it. Okay, She's just dropped the clod from the grass field in the column next to her. And there's some mechanical disruption of some smaller aggregates. They're falling off. Okay, 25 minutes later, you see the one closest to me. It's Yeah, technically it's not dissolved, but yes, it broke down. I mean, there's, there was no water-stable structure there. And so now all those particles are either at the bottom or suspended in the water column. So as soon as water hits that soil, it seals. So water runs off. It can't infiltrate. You get less oxygen getting into the soil. You've got less fertility. You've got worse water quality issues in that watershed. You've got greater erosion. You've got a host of problems. This is what we ought to be looking at. And it is important. It absolutely is important. And, and proper grazing management to increase soil carbon is important, but frequently not for the reasons that are so commonly cited and promoted, which gains traction for the argument, which I think hurts us in the long run. Um, this is another demonstration. This is a rainfall simulator. I talked about this last night. Up above, you've got an oscillating sprinkler going back and forth. You've got four different soil surfaces that they've captured. And so you've got from farthest away, you've got a clean till soil surface. You've got an overgrazed pasture next. You've got a well-managed pasture next. And then you've got this cover crop. This idea of keeping something green and growing in the field for as much of the year as possible to protect that soil and keep growing roots in the soil. Then it's set up so that only the water that runs off the surface gets collected in the jar. Yes? Okay. So in the time it took to collect a gallon's worth of sediment-laden water from the conventional and the poorly managed pasture, we've got a third of a gallon from cover crop and none from pa the well-managed pasture. Well-managed pasture is the best thing going for water infiltration. Even better than cover crop. But it's got to be well managed. Management's key. So just because it's pasture doesn't mean, right? So just because you put a fence around it, don't make it a pasture in my mind. Might make it an equine gymnasium, but not a pasture. Um, soil carbon gain under well managed grazing, it matters where you are. Different values have been determined. And these have the potential to be huge when we look at large areas, right? So we're, we're talking about something that is significant. Don't mean to act like I'm minimizing it. I'm just trying to properly set it. So the keys to healthy soil, and see how many of these align with forage agriculture. We need to cover the soil, yep. Need high plant density, yep. Minimize soil mechanical disturbance, yep. Grow plants for maximum days each year, yep. Incorporate well-managed ruminants, there we go and manage livestock to enhance soil function. So there we are. Again, if we don't have soil, we don't have anything else. And we're losing soil globally. When it's gone, it takes thousands of years to weather parent material back to, to soil. Um, already been through this, 4% of the Earth's surface is suitable for cultivation. Far more is suitable for some for, uh, form of Livestock, uh, ruminant livestock system. <clears throat> Virtually all of the world's arable land is already in production. So it's not like we've got this big bank of to be exploited yet. I mean, there's a lot of marginal land that we can put a lot of inputs in to try, but there's a cost to that. And better maybe just to 
maybe shift our dietary focus a little bit. They're, sorry. Central role of ruminants in human nutrition. <clears throat> so, <laughs> a little confused, sorry. Really, there's only three things we can do to produce food from land. We can grow crops to be used directly. We can grow anim raise animals on dedicated, you know, continuous range land, pasture land, or we can grow forage crops on land that can periodically be cultivated, okay? Last two, obviously, are going to go to ruminants, from which we get essential nutrition. Um, from the plant, not so much, but we can feed that to humans. But when we do, we produce a lot of byproducts. And those byproducts can be fed to livestock and are. Let's see. A very key function of ruminant animals is that they can take non-protein nitrogen and through the microbial activity in the rumen form high quality, balanced, animal source protein for human use. Uh, this Protein is limiting in natural environments, and so is fat. And those two things are key to human flourishing. And ruminants are the key to providing that in every ecosystem man has ever successfully settled in. They've domesticated a ruminant to live there with them. Um, we've got nutrient management issues. That system is pretty well broken. Um, but livestock remove far less nutrients from the land that they occupy than the crops that we produce. And then we ship those crops into cities, and now we've got to get rid of those nutrients somehow, and that's a whole other issue that doesn't come into the sustainability conversation. <clears throat> there is no sustainable food systems without livestock globally. At least half of the cereals in the world can only be produced with animals in the farm system. And developing country mixed crop livestock systems, most of them small holders supply a large portion of cereal and livestock products globally. So anything people are proposing, we need to think about how that might impact small holders. Because without them, how are we going to replace the food? It's hard to imagine, but draft power is still important globally. Half of the farmers in the world depend on draft animals, a large number of those being ruminants. <clears throat> and if you don't have livestock, where's your fertilizer coming from? Over half of the world's fertilizer ends up coming from manure. And almost a quarter of the nitrogen globally comes from manure. And if we don't use manure nitrogen, then we're going to use natural gas. OK? And it's important to recognize what I mentioned before. The livestock and the cropping enterprises are integrated. In many places, it's on the same farm. In much of the US, that's been separated. <clears throat> but on a system basis, they're still integrated. Right, explain that. Silvopastoral systems like the panel at the bottom in Brazil. We can grow trees, grass, and cattle. We can rotate some other crop on the grass and periodically come in and you know, plant something else and then come back to grass while the trees are growing. So these systems are more and more being researched and there's good work going on. If somebody wants to talk about cereal production and the cereals that go into livestock, just recognize that nearly two-thirds of today's cereal crop is already feeding human beings. So we're not looking at a whole lot that's left over. right? And maybe that's the problem. <laughs> maybe the problem is the grain-fed people. Again, ruminant animals, because they consume these byproducts of crop production, this now becomes a resource to integrate with the forage crops. And again, it's something that humans can't utilize for food, but now, thanks to ruminants, we get food. <clears throat> the majority of the arable land is already producing food and fiber for human consumption. The vast majority of it. I uh, won't spend too much time there. I'm looking at the clock. So ruminants, forage agriculture increases the human edible 
the, the human food supply and improves the quality of humanity's food supply. Upcycles and globally all of livestock. 86% of what all of the domestic animals consume is not human edible. So when people say, if we didn't have this, we'd have that, it's like, well, no, you wouldn't. Uh, and for ruminants, it's more like 96% of what they eat globally is not human edible. And yeah, there's land that just should never be tilled, never, ever, ever, ever. And that's the majority of the Earth's surface. And I beg people to realize the world that we live in looks a lot different than what we exist in here. All right, so here's a woman with a platter of dung on her shoulder. And those pats on the wall behind her are dung pats drying so that she can burn it for fuel to cook on. And three, you know, a billion people in the world still have not gotten to experience electricity on a routine basis. Right? They don't have access to it, which means that nothing, everything that we take for granted is unknown. That includes reliable, safe drinking water. That includes water treatment. That includes refrigeration, all those things, let alone the lights. Um, Hans Rosling, I recommend his book, Factfulness. He talks about how um, when his parents, as he was a boy, they got electricity in Sweden, and then he got his, his mother. His mother got a washing machine. It was the first washing machine that they had seen. Apparently, they were doing all right. So it's a f He said his grandmother pulled her chair up in front and watched it work. This was so remarkable. And it was really cute. What he showed was, he said, his mother then had the time to take him to the library to introduce him to a whole world that he was unaware of at the time. He ended up being a physician working internationally. Um, and at one point in his talk, he said, this, uh, it's a magic machine. He opened it up. He said, you put dirty clothes in, closed it, opened it back up. He says, and take books out. <laughs> Three billion people are relying on dirty biofuels for cooking, and that's a significant source of childhood respiratory disease. Ha factfulness, Hans Rosling, R-O-S-L-I-N-G, Hans. <sighs> Here we go. So first of all, it's cattle burps, not farts. You're welcome. I mean, I love me a good fart joke as much as the next guy, you know? A high quality sense of humor. But um, I think it does say something about the sophistication of the conversation that too many people don't know that. OK. And let's just start off with the fact that these animals are not alchemists. They're not creating carbon and nitrogen out of nothing. They're cycling it. And their impact on the environment because of that is fundamentally different than crop agriculture. In 2012, I gave a presentation, and this was one of the slides, and people brains exploded. Kind of fun to watch. Um, you know, this is just back of envelope calculations, and you can get to negative just by making some basic assumptions. So here, let's go back to photosynthesis. We've got a plant taking water for, from the roots, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, then fixing that CO2 right into carbohydrate to make the plant. Now, that plant is above and below ground. And in a perennial plant, it's about equal. OK, so now we're going to bring a ruminant along, and it's going to eat some portion of that above ground plant. 
but not all of it. Remember, I talked about leaving four or six inches. So you're leaving residue behind, plus all the roots that are below ground. They're not grubbing those out. OK, so now the cow has eaten some portion of that. Some portion of what it ingests will be emitted. It will respire CO2 directly, or methane will be produced in the rumen as a result of anaerobic fermentation. OK, but it's not all of it. Some portion remains. The really cool thing that I didn't understand at this time is that methane that comes out is oxidized back to CO2 within about 10 years. So there's much more nuance to the conversation, but it's cycling. CO2 atmosphere into the plant, into the animal, back to the atmosphere, and so on. It's not adding CO2 that didn't exist in the atmosphere before. It's not enriching. Now, let's say we're growing crops, burning lots of fossil fuels, using synthetic fertilizers or fertilizers we had to truck in from some other place, burning fossil fuels to do it. Right, So very different, because when we burn fossil fuels, we add CO2 to the atmosphere. Half-life of CO2 in the atmosphere is like a 1,000 years. A little different. And let's make sure that we're talking about accurate numbers. If anybody tells you that cows produce more you know, greenhouse gases than all of... Yeah. Remember that phrase, MBFM? OK, so here's some figures. This is from EPA under a previous administration. Okay, they're, they're doing the work. They're trying to account for it. So all of agriculture in the United States is 9% of the anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. All of agriculture. All of animal agriculture is 4%. Somebody help me with the maths. 9 minus 4 is what? Is 5 larger or smaller than 4? Larger. So that means plant agriculture is already larger emitter than livestock agriculture. Oh, that's awkward. Because they want us to eat more plants, don't they? Okay, that's interesting. Beef is 2%. And transportation is 28%. Electrical generation, 28%. Industry is 22%. These are life cycle analyses. Okay, so they're comparing apples to apples here. If you want to look specifically at methane, the level for the United States is the green line at the bottom since 1961. That's methane emissions in the United States from ruminant animal agriculture. But my understanding is during that time, the ruminants, the cows did a bigger quantity of it during that time. Actually, I think, I think it would be fair to say that we're producing the same amount of beef but with fewer animals. So our productivity has increased. So that's one of the ways you get to reducing emissions. Um, but so the black line is the industrialized world. You know, we we're recovering from a war, a war, so it took them a while, you know, but their trend has been down for a significant period of time. The upward trend is in the, in the developing world. And we can reduce that 30 some percent, it's been estimated. Lots of things we can do and I'd be happy to talk about that. But we got to get people to the point where they recognize that this is a requirement. Right, we, we still have too many people dominating the conversation who act as if this is an extra, the, that we can get rid of this. And, and we need to get the conversation shifted to where, okay, given that we have to do this, given that animal source food is essential in the diet of human beings for proper development and function, period, full stop. How much and what form that, okay, we can talk about that, but that animal source foods are required should not be in debate. We can look at global livestock. It's a little different. 14.5 is the figure for global emissions due to livestock. Make sure that they're not putting all that on beef animals. They'll do that in the conversation. All of beef animals globally is 6%. Okay, The U.S. portion of that global figure is less than half of a percent. And if you just look at the portion of U.S. of the total beef it's 8%. So we have 9% of the world's beef animals. We produce 19% of the world's beef, and we produce 8% of the greenhouse gas emissions due to beef. Well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, certainly countries like India, China, and Brazil, I think, have larger beef herds. The question of their productivity is, a little different. 
Um, if I double beef consumption in the United States, the greenhouse gas emissions from that would be less than the tailpipe emissions that come from driving a car 2,700 miles that gets 25 miles per gallon, or flying one round trip from JFK to LAX via Denver. And those last two are tailpipe emissions. That's just the emissions due to burning the fuel versus the life, life cycle emissions for double the... What are we even talking about? What? I don't understand the emissions to the Well, it's driven by politics. It's driven by power. It's driven by economics. It's driven um, for control of people, of markets, of politics, of finances. And the, the, there are people who fundamentally don't think um, humans are any different than any other organism. They, I mentioned them before, they're anti-human. If you believe in animal rights, you do not believe in human rights, period, philosophical. Now, animal rights and animal welfare, different things, right? Make sure you got that right, okay? If we were to get rid of all animal agriculture and the pets, right, we've got 9 million dairy cows and 9.5 and million horses. They never mention the horses. Isn't that interesting? Fundraising might get hurt. Um, so, and, and the other point to mention here is the animals don't get to hang around. So we're getting rid of all the animals in the United States. So after the world's largest barbecue, what kind of benefit do we have? Well, cost benefit, potential benefit. We would reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the United States by 2.6%. It's projected that we would reduce global emissions by less than four-tenths of a percent. I'm not sure you can measure that. What are the costs? Oh, we'd unbalance our food ecosystem and we create essential dietary nutrient deficiencies. Yeah. Is that worth it? I don't think so. Um, studies have been done. Um, we were comparing a grass finishing system to a feedlot system in upstate, uh, in upper Midwest on previously cropped ground with a specific management of uh, grazing management protocol. And what we basically see is higher emissions in the grass finishing phase. That's biology. Shouldn't surprise people. Um, but this carbon sequestered under that grazing management more than offset the emissions in that finishing. Now, think it through. It was crop ground. Organic matter had been depleted. So it's going to establish a new equilibrium over time. It doesn't just continuously increase, right? But still, okay, so it increases. That's a good thing. And all the things we've talked about before for soil health. The second thing is, what about the cow-calf phase if we were raising these animals under an appropriate grazing? Well, what if, if you more than offset the, sequ the emissions from the grass finishing, that means you're negative for animals going into a feedlot finishing. So we're real close now to where I was t in 2012 by saying cattle are carbon neutral to carbon negative regardless of how they're finished. It takes a while for the science to catch up. People can say all kinds of things, and it gets out there, and then it takes a while to get the data. Um, we're dealing with people. Um, sorry, I'm getting crazy here. Um, please pay attention to the simple fact that the pharmaceutical industry has an environmental footprint. OK? If the average type 2, if the average American type 2 diabetic could eliminate their medication use, they would reduce their carbon footprint 29% more than if they went from a vegan, to a meat heavy to a vegan diet. And we know they can stay on the diet that produces the elimination of the medication need, the reversal of the diabetes. We also know they can't stay on the vegan diet. So, I just want, you know, to have people imagine what, what way might, might there be a way, and yes, here's the Verda study demonstrating 40% of type 2 diabetics enrolled in this trial elim eliminating medication use. Type 2 diabetes reversal has been demonstrated. Now, people get crazy with the word reversal, okay, whatever. If they went back into the office to be retested on the tests that diagnosed them as a diabetic, they'd no longer be diagnosed as a diabetic. Call it whatever you want. 
Um, it has an, oh, here's, I'll just, am I close? Oh, yeah, I'm close. Um, the more fat you eat, the less carbohydrate you eat, the less CO2 you emit. It's almost like it comes out somewhere, right? The more fiber you eat, the more methane is generated somewhere. Um, did I really go there? I did. Um, so again, all of U.S. animal agriculture produces 4% of greenhouse gas emissions. Beef is 2, the healthcare system's 10. It's time for us to have a more balanced conversation about this, if we're going to talk about this. <clears throat> but frankly, the pain and suffering, the diminished human lives are enough for us to not worry about that argument and just focus on people improving their health. Um, we don't even know how to talk about protein. We talk about it incorrectly. Um, I'm up against the time which I apologize for. So in parting, I'm not a medical doctor. Nothing I've said should be considered medical advice. I am happy to introduce you to practitioners. I'm happy to introduce you to the literature that I'm aware of. If you'd like to get in touch with me, there's a lot of contacts and ways to do that. As I said, I've published I posted a PDF of this slide set and the one that I used last night on my Facebook and uh, Twitter accounts. And if you have specific questions that you don't get to ask today, I'm here in all day, um, please feel free to email me. Thank you very much.